All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to get started with this afternoon's program here. Good afternoon, and welcome to Global Hotspots. The Global Hotspots series is co-sponsored by the Wisconsin Alumni Association, PLATO, and the UW-Madison Division of International Studies. On behalf of all the sponsors, thank you for joining us today. My name is Terry Rayom, and I am a current UW-Madison student, as well as an alumni and donor engagement intern at the Wisconsin Alumni Association. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, John Peavy House. Professor Peavy House is backed by popular demand to shed light on the most important political issues facing our world today. He is a professor for political science here at UW. This spring, he is teaching courses on American foreign policy. His presentations are insightful, entertaining, and packed with information. The professor's research interests include international relations, international political economy, American foreign policy, international organizations, and political methodology. He has several pub publications on various topics, including human rights institutions, exchange rate politics, regional trade agreements, and many more. Today, he will give us an update of what is happening in international relations today. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Professor PV House. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me back. Uh, I usually tell people, if you see me giving talks, or even if I, uh, I'm lucky on the news, something bad is happening. Uh, so, uh, and uh, unfortunately, in the world of international relations, it seems like something bad uh, is indeed always happening. So, obviously, there's a lot of topics that we could discuss today. I've, I've chosen three. Uh, and I'm going to keep an eye on the clock to make sure I don't go too long because I want to leave lots of time for questions and answers if there are other topics people want to cover. Uh, but the three topics I want to cover today, uh, the first one is uh, Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu's visit to Congress coming up. Uh, the second is the war in Ukraine, uh, the continuing war in Ukraine. Uh, and third uh, is what's going on in Syria and Iraq with the battle against ISIS. And in particular, I want to think a little bit about both what's going on in that region and also President Obama's request to authorize force from Congress uh, to go to essentially to fight uh, more uh, in Syria. So, and again, if there's other topics, we'll, we'll leave time for those, for those as well. So that said, those three topics, there's a lot to get through. Those of you who were here last spring might remember, I was fortunate enough that my mother was in town and she came to visit. Great having her in the crowd. I asked her afterwards, Mom, what did you think? She said, you did well, but you talked way too fast. So, <laughs> uh, and I've always listened to my mother, and I've done pretty well. It was her, after all, who told me, John, as you go out into the world, it's not who you know. It's whom you know. Uh, <laughs> so, so. Uh, with that, with my mother's advice in mind, uh, let's, let's start talking about uh, the Prime Minister uh, Benjamin Netanyahu's visit and speech to Congress, which will happen uh, March 3rd, coming up next week. So there, you've probably noticed there's a lot of politics going on behind this, this speech. The first thing that's unusual about it, it, he will not clearly be the first Israeli Prime Minister to come to the United States or to address Congress, but what's, so what's different about this? Well, the first thing that's different is that he was not invited by President Obama. He is the first international dignitary to address Congress without a specific uh, invitation from the State Department or the President of the United States. He was invited by the Speaker of the House, John Boehner. And when Boehner first announced his visit, he claimed that this was a bipartisan invitation issued on part behalf of Congress to the Prime Minister of Israel, which about five minutes later was denied by the Democratic leadership saying we had no idea he was being invited, the White House had no idea he was being invited, and the State Department had no idea he was being invited. So this is clearly right, a partisan issue. I mean, everything else is polarized, it seems, in the United States, so why not foreign policy as well? Uh, why is Netanyahu coming? Why did, why did Boehner invite him? Why is he coming? There are two issues uh, at play here. There are kind of two things going on. The purported reason and the publicly stated reason uh, for Boehner inviting Netanyahu was about the Iranian nuclear negotiations. So the United States and Iran have been negotiating now many, several years 
uh, about the future of Iran's nuclear program. And I won't, I'm happy to go into this in Q&A, but for now we'll just say, we've talked about this before, right? Iran has this program, they want nuclear weapons. Uh, for what purpose? Uh, they claim it's peaceful. Israel says it's not. We think it's not necessarily peaceful. So there's a lot of politics behind Iranians' nuclear move. About three years ago, significant negotiations started over the future of Iran's program between the United States, uh, Russia, and Iran, with a couple European partners thrown in. Israel was left on the side of these negotiations. They're very angry about being left out of these negotiations uh, because it was the former uh, Iranian president who said right, that if they got these weapons, they could easily attack and destroy Israel. Right? So this makes Israel very nervous. If you talk to Israelis, they refer to this as the existential threat to their survival. Right? And for, you know, for, for good reason. You know, they have a hostile country that will then have nuclear weapons that could easily deliver them uh, into Tel Aviv, into Jerusalem, you know, into Haifa, you name it. They could, they could, Iran could reach very easily with these weapons should they develop them. So in the meantime, these negotiations are continuing with Israel on the outside. Netanyahu, from the beginning, has been angry that he's been on the outside. So Israeli intelligence will occasionally, well, the US will occasionally share what's going on with Israeli intelligence. Israeli intelligence, according to now, uh, uh, and now Secretary of State Kerry, that immediately leaks everything that's been happening, right? Because they're unhappy and they want to try to derail these. So the US is trying to push these negotiations. The Obama administration believes these negotiations can be brought to a successful conclusion. Many Republicans, even some centrist Democrats in the United States disagree. They say even if we get an arrangement with Iran, Iran will likely cheat, just as North Korea did 15 years ago when we reached a nuclear deal with them. North Korea then cheated, they built the weapons anyway. The fears that Iran will do, will sign an agreement and continue to build the weapons anyway. It's really about a matter of trust between the US and Iran. In the meantime, Israel, who sees itself as the main victim, should Iran develop these weapons, is upset they don't have a, a say at the negotiating table. So over the last six months, these uh, negotiations between Iran and the United States have kind of been start and stop. Iran will pull out. The US will get mad. We'll threaten more sanctions. Iran will come back to the table. A lot of back, seesawing back and forth. They haven't gone anywhere, but they also haven't collapsed. Everyone's still talking, right? So a lot of, uh, a lot of chess, diplomatic chess going on. Republicans in Congress are starting to get upset with this. And they say, look, all Iran's doing is biding time. They're just stalling so they can make these weapons. Our best intelligence is they'd have to stall for about 10 years before they get a, a good fleet of these things ready to go. Uh, some say less, some say six years. But the bottom line is they'd have to delay a long time. So Obama says, that's not true. We're going to take our time. We'd rather have an agreement than no agreement at all. So meantime, Congress keeps threatening sanctions. Obama says, I'm going to veto them. Right? You can pass all the sanctions you want. I'm going to veto them if you pass them. So this is Boehner's attempt to one up Obama right, on the foreign affairs stage. He said, look, let's hear from the people who matter the most on this, the Israelis. Right? And of course, Kerry and Obama say, no, they are not the ones who matter the most. It's the Americans who matter the most, and it's the, you know, the Europeans who matter the most, because they're in the sights of these weapons, too, uh, should Iran choose to build them. In the meantime, Obama, the, the balancing game Obama's playing in Iran is right. There's a pretty moderate leader in Iran right now, not on the, not on the religious side, but on the political side. Uh, the Iranian leadership we see is somewhat moderate at this point, and we have this window to lock them into an agreement right now. Uh, and, and the concern is that if Congress runs and puts a bunch of sanctions or we walk away in a huff, that then the hardliners in Iran are going to stand up and say, see, we told you. You lefties in Iran, right, and they see the current leadership in Iran is left, very left wing. You guys failed. You reached out to the West. They slapped us down. Forget it, right? And so we're attentive to the domestic politics of Iran. Iran's attentive to the domestic politics of what's going on in this country, as are the Israelis. So that's kind of the big issue, I think. And so this is what Netanyahu will spend a lot of his time commenting on, is the Iranian nuclear program and the fact that he contends that the United States has simply given up in stopping Iran. And is the Israeli leadership contends that we've given up and we're just sort of ceding nuclear weapons to Iran. Uh, uh, Secretary of State Kerry yesterday and this morning came out in very strongly worded terms and said he disagrees with Netanyahu, and that in fact he actually questioned Netanyahu's judgment right, over the Iranian nuclear program. So of course, the second background issue here is of course domestic politics in Israel. There's an election coming up in Israel, a parliamentary election in a couple of weeks. This was the other reason why Obama was refusing to invite Netanyahu to, to address Congress. It's unprecedented to uh, essentially invite 
someone in the middle of a re-election battle, a foreign leader in the middle of a re-election battle, to come to the United States, right? Because then it looks like we're taking sides, right? Then it looks like the United States is getting involved in their domestic politics and giving the seal of approval to Netanyahu, right? Or any other foreign leader who might come during their re-election time. So from that sense, there was a lot of diplomatic norms that kind of that were very much broken here. So you've got uh, this election coming up. Netanyahu's in a real fight. Many people think that Likud, his party, will lose the majority in the Knesset, uh, and that they'll have to be there won't be a single party potentially that unseats him, but there'll be a, a variety of sort of left-leaning to middle-of-the-road parties uh, that will get Net that will sort of relieve Netanyahu of his prime ministership. Uh, about a fifth of Israelis are undecided, according to the polls that came out this last week. Uh, and it's sort of neck and neck at this point with a lot of undecided people. So it's a very neck and neck uh, election. Ironically, a lot of commentators on Israeli politics think his visit here will hurt him. Uh, that in fact, the, the narrative in Israel is that he kind of did break this taboo of traveling a lot during re-election time. He forced himself on the Americans and that this could come back, you know, the Americans might do something uh, negative to Israel and that then he would be blamed for this. That said, uh, the U.S.-Israeli issue is not the prime issue in the Israeli elections. It's more about domestic politics there. It's more about the domestic economy, state of the housing market, future of the settlements, right, sort of traditional stuff of Israeli politics. So those are, those are I think, the two, the two issues that are going on with Netanyahu's visit. I'll make one very quick point, uh, and then I'll move on to Ukraine. There's a real interesting change, and I don't have good answers for you on this, but I just want to plant this seed. Uh, as you read the news about what's going on. The American public has changed a lot in its views on Israel over the last decade. Uh, it's 20 years, maybe. 20 years ago, you, the, the modal Democratic voter in the United States was quite pro-Israel. The modal Democratic president, remember Clinton administration, very pro-Israel, never criticized, quietly criticized, but kept that out of the media, very supportive. Republicans, 20, 30 years ago, were somewhat ambivalent. They weren't, certainly weren't against Israel, but they weren't ready to throw in you know, all their weight behind Israel. Uh, George H.W. Bush at one point lifted $400 million in loans and took it back from Israel after we'd given it to them in protest of building new settlements. Right? And this was a very common view in the Republican Party. That has switched completely today, and all the polling shows this. Republicans are now the champions of Israel, and Democrats are far more ambivalent about the future of Israel. This is true even of Jewish Americans, where you find especially younger Democrats who proclaim to be Jewish, say they don't know about the future of Israel, they see no need to return, they see the, the idea of an aliyah or moving back is just a ridiculous idea, and in particular they hate Netanyahu. Right? Uh, and so you're starting to get a change of generations, I would argue, in the United States, both among the Jewish population and among the non-Jewish population about views to Israel. Republicans have become very pro-Israeli, witness Boehner's inviting uh, of Netanyahu. Uh, but also Democrats are tending to really split down the middle on this. There's still a large block of the Democratic Party that's very pro-Israeli, but now, again, in the younger side of the Democratic Party, they're incredibly ambivalent. Again, not anti by any stretch, but just far more ambivalent and would not be unhappy if someone like Obama pushed them very hard on issues of settlements. So I think on top of uh, you know, the Netanyahu visit are these kind of shifting demographics in the United States as well, and Netanyahu wants to try to reach out to both sides he may end up uh, doing neither of these, reaching out to neither side, but, but that's definitely a possibility. Okay, so that's, I think, I think what's kind of interesting about the Netanyahu visit. Uh, second topic is Ukraine. And as I'm sure you're all aware, uh, for the last couple of years, there's been a terrible conflict over Ukraine, in particular the eastern portions of Ukraine. Uh, the first domino to fall was uh, Crimea, the island of, the, of Crimea, uh, which, uh, had a referendum and voted to rejoin Russia as a country. The Ukraine, Ukraine very much objected to this, saying the vote was rigged, that Russia had undue influence in the election, et cetera. But that, that die has kind of been cast. Crimea is now uh, functionally uh, trying to become part of Russia again. But then there was also a rebellion that broke out in the eastern provinces of Ukraine, again, where most individuals are ethnically Russian, uh, to try to uh, do just what Crimea did, right? Let's carve ourselves off from Ukraine and let's join Russia. And again, uh, one can understand some of the, the motivation there. Most of these folks are ethnically Russian. Many of them have been there for several generations, or some of them were forcibly moved there by Stalin uh, from Russia several gener couple generations ago. So you've had, and then the Ukrainian central government, which is in, uh, very much supported by the West, by both, by essentially the NATO countries, if you want to think about it that way, 
France, Germany, Great Britain, the United States. Uh, Ukraine has been battling these quote unquote rebels in the east. Now I say quote unquote rebels. Many of these are Ukrainians who are Russian ethnically who are fighting for independence. Most everyone agrees they're doing most of the fighting with Russian weapons, right? Russia has been funneling in advisors and lots and lots of weapons into eastern Ukraine. And in fact, there's a lot of reports that Russia is putting its most high-tech weapons in because they're using these as practical field tests, right? Uh, that in fact, especially its tanks, its anti-aircraft, uh, a lot of its new handheld weaponry, its electronic weaponry, the most cutting edge things are being sent to the Ukrainian rebels so they can see how they work. Right. Uh, these are the latest reports coming out this last week. Uh, so uh, unfortunately, while you've got all this politics going on about the Ukraine, a lot of people are dying. Uh, the best estimates are about 6,000 people have been killed uh, in the last year and about 14,000 wounded in eastern Ukraine. Um, that fatalities number, of course, includes about the 300 people who died in that Malaysian airliner that was shot down uh, as it flew over Ukraine as well. Uh, there's about 5.2 million people living in areas affected by the violence. Uh, it's estimated that a million people have been displaced from their homes in various parts of the Ukraine, and about 600,000 have fled to neighboring countries to the west or the south, and about 400,000 have fled into Russia. So about a million displaced internally, about a million displaced beyond the borders, and 6,000 dead. Right? This is a this is a significant military conflict. So what exactly uh, is going on currently? Well, sort of two things to think about here. One is that there was a ceasefire uh, signed actually on uh, Valentine's Day this year, February 14th. <coughs> Excuse me. So you had a ceasefire that was brokered between Russia and Putin, Vladimir Putin, uh, and uh, Ukraine and its president Poroshenko. And it was negotiated by the president of France, uh, Hélène, uh, and Angela Merkel of Germany. So you had these Western powers coming in, sitting down together in Minsk, in, in Belarus, uh, and negotiating for about two days, literally all day, all night, two days. And they reached a 13-point agreement for the war to end and a ceasefire to start. The ceasefire was to start about February 17th. Literally hours after the ceasefire was formally declared, fighting reopened. Right. So the reports are very mixed. There are monitors on the ground suggesting that the fighting is much less widespread than it has been in about six months. So in other words, the scope of the violence has died down. It appears, unfortunately, the intensity of the violence has gone up. Where people are fighting, more people are dying. Uh, and they're fighting for longer periods. It's harder for them to disengage. Uh, so you're getting fewer people fighting. But those who are fighting, the death toll is climbing at a much higher rate than we've seen in the past. A couple possible explanations for this. One is both sides actually believe the ceasefire is going to work. Maybe not tomorrow, but next month, perhaps. And so they're fighting hard for the last, literally the last inches of territory uh, they can get. There's a couple of spots uh, in particular. One is the airport around Donetsk, uh, and another is a, what's essentially now a ghost town uh, of mostly eth formerly ethnically Russians that, that both sides have been fighting over. So, so ironically, it could be a hopeful sign that these are becoming more intense battles because they think any day now they're going to get cut off, and so they just want to be able to put their flag down uh, as far in as possible, to move those lines as far as possible. So that's possible. The, interestingly, the ceasefire calls for immediate withdrawal of troops. It says any foreign fighters must get out. Of course, by foreign fighters, it means Russian, but Putin wouldn't let them say that in the agreement. So, because he denies, Russia to this day denies they're having anything to do with Eastern Ukraine. Right? Putin says these are volunteers. These are people who are retired from the Russian military who happen to have access to Russian military goods, who are taking them voluntarily uh, to the front in Ukraine. Um, sure. Uh, and I've got a bridge over the East River for you as well, uh, if anyone wants to buy that. So, uh, so increased uh, international, uh, what, sort of increased international uh, monitoring of the ceasefire, the OSCE, the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe, has agreed to monitor the ceasefire maybe send in some peacekeepers, et cetera. But of course, they're not going to go in until there's a peace to keep. Right now, there's no peace to keep. Um, so what do we think about all of this? Well, you know, I talk about Putin. Um, so Putin's very unpopular right, in the United States right now. There's a poll done. Uh, I should have mentioned this with, with, in the context of Netanyahu and Israel becoming less popular. A recent poll showed that Netanyahu sort of is very, very polarized Americans, like people either really liked him or really hated him. Everyone hated Putin in that poll, right? He was the only international leader that got negative marks uh, in that poll of Americans. So no one likes Putin. 
in Britain, they don't like Putin. The French don't like Putin. The Germans don't like Putin. Unfortunately, the Russians love Putin. Uh, it's sort of the opposite of Gorbachev. You know, when Mikhail Gorbachev left power, uh, you know, in the 1990s, the line was he could have won re-election in anywhere but his own country. Uh, Putin's the opposite. He could, you know, he'll win re-election in Russia but nowhere else. Uh, so, so what do we think about Putin and, and how, what has the U.S. been trying to do? Well, the U.S. Right, has, been, has put economic sanctions on Russia, but not the traditional sanctions we're used to seeing where we stop wholesale trade or we stop, say, the sale of oil or something like that. That does no good. Russia has all the oil it needs. Uh, but what we've done is freeze the assets of some of the wealthiest Russians, right? So there are these Russian oligarchs, almost all of them uniformly support uh, Putin, or at least are complicit in his rule. So the idea is we're going to put the screws to them. You know, we're going to put the screws to the very wealthiest of the Russians through financial sanctions, through limiting their ability to move cash, their ability to liquidate assets on international markets, et cetera, which, of course, then puts pressure on the Russian currency, on the ruble. This has had some effect. Right? The Russian economy has been in pretty bad shape for the last six months, and it's not getting any better. So even though the sanctions are narrowly targeted, they seem to be having a pretty broad effect because a lot of the people who would be moving money in and out can't do it or they have to do it with some trouble. So this week, the United States announced, given the recent ceasefire and then breakdown, that we're going to strengthen those sanctions. Right? So we're going to re-up the sanctions. So that's possible. Uh, and, and I think that's highly likely that we increase the sanctions on them. Thinking more broadly, how do we think about uh, Putin and his type uh, when we think about American foreign policy? Uh, I would draw your attention to a book by one of my colleagues in the political science department. Uh, Professor Weeks, Jessica Weeks, who wrote a book called Dictators at War and Peace. Uh, it was recently selected by Foreign Affairs as a must read uh, for last year. And she argues in the book uh, that, in fact, the way to think about someone like Putin uh, is the fact that there are kind of different types of leaders of non democracies, right? So not all dictators are made alike, right? And there are certain dimensions on which they differ. And if you think about her theory and her idea, and you put Putin in there, uh, it's that Putin is very much what she would label as a personalist, right? There aren't a lot of people, he, he's surrounded himself with sycophants, right? Like, he's got yes men sitting around him every day. He has very few checks on his power. You know, remember, he actually had to leave office because he was term limited, but then they changed the constitution so he could come back in, right? So he can rig the system all he wants, and, and there aren't a lot of checks on his power. And what do we know about folks like this historically, about personalist leaders, uh, especially that have military or pseudo-military backgrounds? And remember, he was KGB uh, his whole life. So what we know about them is they're actually very bold, right? And from Idi Amin to Gaddafi, uh, Saddam Hussein's tricky. Uh, he's clearly a personalist, but as she points out in her book, all of his military service was uh, essentially fabricated. He actually never served in the military. So you'd see him with these medals on. He gave those to himself. Um, so must be nice. Uh, so, so, and what she shows is that over the last 100 years, dictators who are kind of like this, that insulate themselves uh, very effectively uh, and that have some military background tend to be very aggressive. So her theory predicts we should not be surprised that Putin, he took his time, but that he's going to keep behaving like this and he's going to behave increasingly aggressively. The pessimistic conclusion that one would draw from her work uh, is that, in fact, the problem is because he's insulated himself by people who are yes men and sycophants, he's very unlikely to get messages, right? So the US can send a strong message, we don't like this, we think you're doing bad things. He's not hearing that, right? Because his yes men are saying, well, they're biased. It's the Western media, right? There's always a spin, so where he does not get negative feedback. Uh, Angela Merkel, Merkel herself, about six months ago, uh, several times described Putin as, quote, living in another world. Right, this idea that he actually is not even sure about what's going on with reality because he's got all these yes-men around him. Now, when that happens with Saddam Hussein, Muammar Gaddafi, Idi Amin, Robert Mugabe in Zimbabwe, it's very unfortunate, especially for the people who live there. When this happens in a country that has 12,000 nuclear weapons, that's cause for concern. And so the question is, what can the West do, including the United States, to try you know, to remove Putin? And the answer is, at this point, unfortunately, very little. The sanctions may cause certain individuals to put pressure on him and his leadership. But he's pretty popular, right? 85% of Russians say they support Putin. Now, the question is, how many of those are too scared to say otherwise? Uh, we'll never know. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, you know, her argument and kind of some of her ideas 
suggest that a rather pessimistic, at least short term, uh, to look at Putin. Uh, and that he's basically, he holds a lot of the cards at this point, and that we should certainly do what we can to contain him, uh, but, but there may not be a lot of reason for hope in the short term on this, uh, other than the hopes that the economy will eventually undermine his rule, or at least undermine his efforts uh, in places like Ukraine. Okay. Uh, I should also say, in terms of full disclosure, uh, Professor Weeks is my wife. So uh, I know, <laughs> I, I know her argument quite well. Um, so um, all right. So finally, ISIS. Uh, so I promised to leave Q and A time. So I'll, I'll move through this quickly. Just a couple things to point out here. Uh, you can read the news. You know, ISIS. Uh, these are not uh, nice people. Uh, it's continuing its trail of destruction across Iraq and Syria, and now Libya, uh, where it's starting to exert at least. Some groups who claim they're allied with the Islamic State are trying to assert control. Uh, this, uh, about a month and a half ago, killing of the Jordanian pilot, um, or at least the disclosure that the Iranian pilot had died, the Jordanian pilot had died, uh, actually seems to have wakened Jordan up uh, to this, although about 2,000 Jordanians have fled Jordan to fight uh, with ISIS. Uh, so there's, there's always that. Um, and then the killing of the Egyptians in Libya, right, uh, ended up having the uh, have the effect of having Egypt then start to bomb these ISIS positions in, in Libya. So the more ISIS do, do does, uh, they seem to draw more enemies. And that's only natural, and here's why. So just think briefly about all the major players in this region. Clearly Israel has no love for ISIS. The US has no love for ISIS. The Saudis uh, fear that these kind of Islamic radicals are gonna wake up a jihad movement in their own country, so they wanna shut them down. Saudi, the Saudis have promised to train moderate Syrians as a rebel army against ISIS and train moderate Iraqis to go back to Iraq. Uh, Jordan, again, has now kind of entered the fray a little bit more. Iran has actually been the country that's, other than the United States, done the most against ISIS. Right? The Islamic, Islamic State leadership believes Shia Islam uh, is heretical. Right, to, the, to all Islamic beliefs. And so Iran has been on the front lines. The Revolutionary Guards have actually been infiltrating into Iraq very heavily, uh, training fighters to battle ISIS and trying to retrain the Iraqi army. Ironically, they're doing this literally in some cases a few miles away from the US forces. Right? So you've got Iran's military helping Iraq and the US military helping Iraq, sometimes very close in proximity to one another. Very ironic. Um, in Iraq, in, uh, Iraq itself, uh, you know, former Prime Minister uh, Maliki was not a help on this, so now we have a new Prime Minister, uh, al Abadi. Um, he is going to try to reach out more to the Sunni community uh, to try to make sure they're not feeding into the ISIS movement. Uh, Syria, remember this is where this all started with Syria. It's a great uh, article in Foreign Affairs a couple months ago. It was an interview with, with Assad, and the headline was, I'm still here, right? <laughs> Uh, and I didn't know whether to read that like, I'm still here, like, you know, you've tried and I'm still here, or was it like a, yoo-hoo, I'm still here, like, pay attention to me. Um, so, because no one's paying attention, we kind of forgot about this, right, that the ISIS movement kind of picked up steam because it was, there was a failed state that it was allowed to reform in. Uh, and then they found a lot of uh, folks next door in Iraq who were very sympathetic to the, the movement, especially a lot of former Ba'athist Party members, uh, Sunnis who felt like they had suffered both under the uh, uh, American uh, invasion, but also clearly under the, uh, the, the Iraqi government post-transition. Then of course you've got Turkey, which sees ISIS as a direct threat to its borders. Uh, uh, Turkey has several times to undertaken military missions into Syria to try to cut off uh, ISIS rebels. Uh, they've surrounded several what they consider national historic sites in Syria to keep, the, to keep ISIS away. But of course their overarching concern isn't just border security from ISIS, their concern is that the West is going to decide to arm the Kurds in Iraq, and that the Kurds are going to fight ISIS, and then once they defeat ISIS, all those weapons are then going to find their way to Turkey, to the Kurdish Turks, who are then going to rebel against the Turkish government, which they've done before, and Turkey fears they would again. So, uh, so you have the situation where everyone's kind of on the same page, ironically, right, against ISIS, for the most part. So the question is, you know, what's being done? Why is it more being done? I think more is going to be done. You know, President Obama uh, a couple weeks ago asked Congress to approve authorization to use force. Uh, now, this had already been done, right? We're already bombing ISIS targets. We're already undergoing large-scale campaigns against ISIS. So we kind of, it, this is more asking forgiveness than permission, frankly. Uh, but I think it's interesting. I just want to make this point with an eye towards 2016 uh, and the US elections. 
Uh, I've written a lot on, uh, cause, on uh, Congress and war and, and presidents and war and how they think about war vis-a-vis -vis public opinion. And one of the things I've come to believe is that presidents ask for permission from Congress only in two instances, where they have strong majorities, in other words, Republican presidents with a lot of Republicans in Congress or Democratic presidents with Democrats in Congress, where they have strong majorities and they want to go, right? So, uh, you know, George Bush in 2002 wanted uh, uh, permission to go into Iraq. He got it because he had a majority in one house and there, there were midterm elections coming up in the other house and he knew Democrats didn't have the guts to vote against him and he was exactly right on that. And so that, that happens. Um, so they have majorities and they wanna go or they don't have majorities and they don't wanna go, right? So this is my explanation for why Obama asked Congress two years ago over Syria. He actually didn't wanna to go to war in Syria at all. He wanted to stay out and what better way to do that is to sit there and say, I wanna to go to war but Congress won't let me, right? You lay the blame at Congress, uh, at the feet of Congress, uh, and then you get out of doing what you want, didn't want to do anyway, right? So it's like a win-win. So now, right, ISIS comes around, and that was, remember, that was over the chemical weapons issue. That was the famous red line comment. If they use chemical weapons, we'll go to war. So he says, should we go to war? Congress kind of like stares at its shoes, like doesn't really give an answer, so we don't go to war, right? So they got him out of that. So what about now? Well, first of all, I would point out, we're kind of at war already. Right, so he's asking six months after the fact that we've deployed forces, right? Again, asking forgiveness uh, rather than permission. And second of all, I think his gambit here uh, is simply to make people take a stand. I think he wants every senator and House member to vote on this ISIS operation because he doesn't want them, a year from now, when this is going very badly uh, or very well, he doesn't want them stand up and either take, taking credit or, or casting the blame on him. In other words, he wants Congress saying, we're for this or we're against this. He wants them on record. And if they're on record saying we're for this, he doesn't want them coming back you know, a year saying, well, we told you this was a bad idea. Like, no, you told us, you told me I had permission to do this. I'm doing it. Now, you know, sit down uh, and be quiet. Uh, now, Congress will never do that. But, um, <laughs> but, but nonetheless, I think this is a position taking move. And you already see a lot of responses by senators and representatives trying to get out of this. So Marco Rubio gives, gives a press conference in New Hampshire, of course, where he's doing his presidential thing. And he says, well, I want to, I want to approve force, but not war, right? I want to approve a lot of attacks, but not war. It's like, well, what's the difference there? Like, tell me the difference between a large scale use of military force and a war, right? This is a semantic distinction, but already people have picked up on this. And both Republicans or Democrats are starting to say this, right? Well, we want to approve you know, a major operation, but not too major, right? And so, of course, they're trying to leave themselves wiggle room here to get out of this, to get out of this later. So I think, uh, I think that's a lot of the politics going on behind this authorization vote that's probably gonna happen uh, sooner rather than later uh, in Congress concerning ISIS. Okay, so I told you I'd try to keep it half an hour, just a couple minutes over. Uh, I talked a little more slowly than usual. I'll blame my mother uh, for, running, for running a little bit late. So very much look forward to your questions about any of this or again, anything else that you, that you want. And I think there's a mic coming around so everyone can hear. Another uh, foreign policy issue that's happened since the last time you spoke is, uh, our fr um, is Cuba. Uh -huh. yeah. And um, I right. actually kind of thought this would be one you would spend a little time with mm. just because of the political ramifications of our increased relationship with Cuba. Yes, great. So, great question. So, Cuba. Uh, so, the normalization with Cuba uh, has begun, and this is not something, uh, I, to be honest, I've spent a, a ton of time thinking about in the last couple of months, but my initial uh, reactions to this were that uh, this was, look, there's been a long push. This is one of these political hot potatoes, right, where most people are indifferent. Most Americans are indifferent about, they don't feel strongly one way or the other about normalization with Cuba. People in Florida feel very strongly about normalization with Cuba. And of course, if you remember the 2000 election, it turns out Florida's kind of important uh, for, for the, the, the national election scene. So of course it was going to take, uh, sit, you know, it was gonna take a lame duck president, right, who's not standing for your election to do something about this, right? So. You'd never have seen this from a first-term president, frankly. Uh, 
so because it was, look, there's, there's a risk of a little bit of a backlash in certain states about this. That said, the business community is thrilled by this. The, the US business community is thrilled. Uh, you know, there's been long complaints in the US business community uh, about things like the Helms-Burton Amendment, right, which forbids trade with Cuba. Uh, even, you know, most, many people, I will go out and say this, including myself, often don't have good things to say about Walmart. Uh, Walmart has been lobbying heavily for, for, for things like normalization uh, because, right, Walmart sells a lot of goods uh, from people from con countries that have strong relations with Cuba. And remember, that's what Helms Burton said. Helms Burton didn't just say you can't trade with Cuba. You can't trade with firms who are invested in Cuba, right? So you may have a shirt, one shirt factory in Cuba, 50 shirt factories in the Dominican Republic, but because you've got that one factory in Cuba, Americans can't do business with you, right? And so Walmart had a lot of suppliers, perhaps not surprisingly, that, that ran afoul of this. Uh, so they started essentially rerouting everything through Canada. So Walmart's, a lot of Walmart's imports in the United States run through Canada, so they don't run afoul of Helms-Burton. So, but that just gives you an example, right? There's a lot of economic interest in favor of this. Um, I mean, remember in 1916, the Cuban Revolution, uh, about 75% of the Cuban GDP were controlled by international interest, right? I mean, it was, you know, their entire telephone system, most of their sugar industry, uh, a lot of their travel industry was controlled by American, you know, firms, a couple Canadian firms. And so there's, there's a lot of history there, which of course is why Cuba wasn't that unhappy for these sanctions either for some time, especially initially in the Castro regime. So I don't know, what I just don't know and, and haven't seen any recent data on is will this come back in like 2016 to haunt one party or the other? Again, I, my sense is Americans don't feel strongly one way or the other about this, uh, unless you're a strong you know, kind of partisan who knows a lot about this on one side or the other. Uh, but yeah, so hopefully this will make life a little less complicated uh, for uh, U.S. relations with, with Latin America because this has been kind of a, a thorn in the side of it because increasingly, you know, the Cold War is over, obviously, and Cuba, the fact that we had this policy against Cuba in many people's eyes made us look, many people's eyes made us look silly in other parts of Latin America too. And so that I think will be a good thing. The long-term electoral consequences uh, I just haven't seen any data. I can't really speculate on that, but great question. All right, sure. Uh, you've done an excellent job explaining, oh. explaining uh, the facts on, in Ukraine. What about, um, what about your prognostication skills? Um, nothing's no. been done to make Putin react because you say he's isolated, he's got syncophants around him. What do you think would it take to do something about making a change? What would the change be? Well, that's a hard question. So first of all, my prognostication skills are terrible. Um, so uh, I'd be in the stock market if I was any good at that. Um, so it's a great question. So a couple thoughts just off the top of my head. The first one, the more troubling one. You know, if you look, so there's an interesting uh, article in Foreign Affairs online two weeks ago by a guy named Alexander Model, who's a Russian uh, political scientist, specializes in the study of Russia at Rutgers. And he argued that Putin's on his last legs. He actually thinks Putin, within the next 12 months, will lose power. I think it's way too optimistic, but his arguments were interesting. Uh, I don't know if they're right, but I think they were interesting. His uh, line is that, and he started out by saying, yes, 85% of the Russians love Putin, but we don't know if people are just too scared to say otherwise, right? So we actually don't know what his support is. He said, look, you know, a lot of people, a lot of Russians have died in Ukraine, and just like, uh, you know, eventually the Afghanistan war, you know, and the Soviet involvement in Afghanistan, that became uh, a very strong uh, domestic political issue in the Soviet Union at the time. Uh, and Gorbachev begins to pull them out because, turns out, Russians are very conflict casualty sensitive as well. They're not that much different than Americans. We didn't know that during the Cold War, of course, but now we know that Russians respond very badly to, to deaths in conflict. And so more Russians are dying. So he says, look, that's only going to, that can only reduce his popularity. Secondly, he said, 
on the economic side, he said, look, these sanctions are doing a lot of good in terms of uh, putting pressure on Putin. And that he said, look, if we do more, then it's going to hurt them even more. And that he think his argument, somewhat counter to Professor Weeks' argument, is that there are a handful of people still in Russia who could take him out, essentially, who could wrest power from him. Um, again, I'm not a, a Russian specialist. I don't know exactly all the politics inside there. Uh, so that, that could be a possibility. Uh, you could imagine one of these, you could imagine a, a number of you know, these oligarchs getting some military forces behind them right, and moving against him. Um, we know, for example, in Moscow, the, Moscow is the one place Putin is not particularly popular. Uh, these mayoral elections that happened last fall, uh, Putin's favorite candidate ended up winning but barely and had to go in a runoff uh, and against a very anti-Putin opposition candidate who people frankly were surprised was allowed to run at all and that he wasn't arrested. So, uh, so, so there's that. So model, I, don't, I just don't know if he's right, uh, but you've at least got some uh, Russian folks out there saying there is, he could be taken out. I think the economic angle, so my second point is the economic angle is the one to think about. You know, um, the sanctions are pounding the ruble, uh, they're pounding their foreign exchange. Uh, this is going to hurt Russian trade in the short, in the medium term especially. Uh, oil prices are down, right? Russia relies on so much of its income from oil. This is why the United States has been so nice to Saudi Arabia. The reason you're paying just a little over $2 for gas is that the Saudis are constantly undermining the OPEC quotas right now. They are pumping as much oil out of the ground as they've ever pumped, right? And they're doing this partially because they want to put the screws to uh, a couple regimes, Iran, and they want to put the screws to Russia, right? And they're doing that because we've asked them to, right? And that we're saying, we haven't said undermine Russia, but we've said, look, Russia, we don't like Russia. It'd be great if you did this, right? And of course, it serves American political purposes as well, because it turns out one predictor of presidential popularity is the price of gas, right? Um, so, so you've got this situation where Russia has very, the oil prices are down, currencies under attack, uh, exports are troubling, and the other place it could make more money is by exporting more natural gas. But where does all their natural gas go through? Ukraine, right? So they've got the, the so model kind of takes all these things and says, look, if you actually step back and take a look, Putin might actually be in trouble. Uh, I, that's the best I can, that's the best I can do in terms of prognostication. So uh, I'd say the best instrument we have left are the sanctions. I mean. This is one of those cases where I think they are doing some good, and they certainly are putting pressure. Whether it's going to be enough pressure, I don't know. So, uh, professor, um, question well, is a follow-up we'll on that there. from uh, Professor Stephen Walt from Harvard, who was uh, speaking about two weeks ago in the Foreign Policy magazine about how it's ludicrous to start thinking about uh, putting a lot of pressure from the United States on Putin. Mm -hmm. uh, we should let Merkel and the others in the European Union do, do that kind of work. And we should really back out of this because it's really not in our self-interest. Mm -hmm. um, how would you and Professor Weeks re respond to that? Um, so uh, good question. I, I'm not going to besmirch her reputation. Uh, I'll just say, I'll say how I will respond. Uh, Steve and I, uh, Steve Walt, uh, for years was at the University of Chicago. and. Uh, He's very much, he kind of has this very realist attitude towards, towards the world. And if you've read his stuff in foreign policy, um, you would know that, uh, you, you know that he's, he's very much uh, sort of the US national interest, right, should kind of trump everything. And his argument, along with John Mearsheimer, his co-author, who's now still at the University of Chicago, on Ukraine has been, uh, this is just not in our interest. Like, let the, this is a European crisis, let the Europeans take care of it. Uh, and to the evidence of the, or, you know, some people may be listening to this, you know, in the negotiations over the ceasefires, the U.S. really hasn't been that involved, right? This has been Germany and France that's been doing this. So, and, you know, the question is, uh, can the U.S. step back? And where I disagree with Walt, I'll tell you where I disagree with Walt on this. Uh, Steve, I think, under, underestimates the power uh, or the potential kind of political implications of what this could mean for NATO. Because right, all these are our NATO allies. And one of the biggest criticisms often made of the United States uh, is that you know, we're kind of moving at odds with some of our NATO allies. France often uh, 
uh, the, so even sometimes the British, sometimes the Germans. Uh, and so NATO is this, it's not fragile, but NATO has its strains, right? And if you value NATO, and Walt doesn't as much because Steve's a realist and he thinks alliances are good for wars but nothing else, and you don't need peacetime alliances. Uh, so uh, he thinks that NATO is not that big of a cost, and I, that's where I disagree. I think it is, and I think if we're seen as just sort of abdicating and sort of saying we're pulling back, or abdicating, I should say, and pulling back, um, I think people then start to question our NATO policy a little bit. Uh, now, that is a, we haven't taken the lead, uh, and we, I don't think we'll take the lead, but I do think we will continue to press Russia on this. So, sorry, we had a question down here. Anyone have a question? Finally. <laughs> Hi, thank you. Um, I would like to know, do the, our leaders truly believe that North Korea and Iran are similar? 